Welcome back everyone. We are back indeed. I hope you enjoyed the film. This is a shot that's early in the film. Okay, so we have Benjamin. He is in front of his fish tank and it looks almost, I mean, we know his head is not in the water, but the idea that his head is framed by the fish tank is indeed a visual representation of the theme. And what is that theme? Isolation. If your head is underwater, it's also a form of suffocation. He's drowning. And there's also that little guy, you might have noticed him a few times, right? The little diver guy, that represents to some degree Benjamin. That's Benjamin. So here, we're looking at Benjamin when he escapes and he goes back from the party. Now remember, this is a party that is thrown by his parents for him. Are any of Benjamin's friends there? No. No, they're not there. It's all older people. They're not his friends. He just can't stand them. He wants to get away from them. But his parents are very proud and so they're showing him off like a trophy. He goes upstairs. And if you remember in this shot, the water is glimmering. The reflection of the pool is glimmering in his face. So again, no accident here. The water is rippling on his face and the water here represents isolation, drowning, suffocation. Notice in the background, and you're gonna see this in a few other shots as well, you've got the target, right? There's that target, the wallpaper behind it, the Venetian slats, look how the frame, look how he's framed. This is important. Now, we don't notice it consciously while we watch the movie, but guess what? We feel it emotionally. We feel it internally. We get the sense in this shot that he's closed in. He's framed by the window frame here. He's framed here. He's trapped. Venetian blinds here, a target here, pretty important. Okay, we'll talk about that in a moment. And yet again, there he is. He's looking in the tank. He's reflecting, but his mind is underwater. Now, here comes the big obvious visual representation. His father literally buys him a scuba suit for his 21st birthday and forces him to wear it and to go into the pool. That shot, if you remember, was very beautiful because the camera was pulling back and we were just seeing him all alone there. This is a good example of something we might call symbolic visual language. This, is, this shot is only on the screen for a moment, but I'm sure you remember it. When his mother convinces him to go downstairs, we pause for a second on this one shot. A clown. The filmmakers could have put any painting there. It could have been a landscape, it could have been fruit, it could have been a portrait of the mom. They didn't choose that one. They specifically chose a portrait of a clown. Because now he knows. He's going downstairs and he's the man of the hour, but how does he feel? Like this. This is how he feels. Notice when he goes downstairs, what kind of a shot is it? It's a close-up. Does it widen out? Does it expand? Or do we always see him in this shot, in this size? We see him like that constantly. So the shot size is a close-up, okay? So it's a very tight shot. It's very, very tight on him. Why? Because that's how he feels. The camera is also handheld. It's not smooth, it's not on a tripod, it's not panning smoothly. Why? Because he feels claustrophobic. So why not film him in a way that conveys his claustrophobia? It's also non-contextual. We can't get a sense of the whole space, the whole room. People are drinking, smoking. We don't get a sense of that. Where are we? We're locked in on Benjamin, right? He's suffocating and we're suffocating because we're almost too close to these people. You can even notice this lipstick, right? He's being pawed, he's being mauled, he's being touched, he's being congratulated. How does he feel? Like a clown, like a diver underwater. Psychologically, we're getting that. We're getting that feeling emotionally without him having to say anything. He doesn't say, geez, mom, you know, I really don't like this. All of your friends are here. Uh, mom, I really don't want to be here. Right? I feel lost, Mom. I feel isolated and alone. 
Wouldn't that be dumb if he said that? The question in film is how do you communicate that without having to say it? This, look at this shot. This guy who tells him the very famous line. One of the most famous lines in this film is the word plastics. Because it's kind of like a joke. This older gentleman, this middle-aged man, trying to tell Benjamin what the future of the economy is going to be, what he should invest in, what should he should get involved in. Plastics. Notice this shot. What's interesting about it? There's a relationship between them. When you look up to someone in that kind of situation, you automatically have a disadvantage. You're at a visual disadvantage and an emotional disadvantage. So we're communicating their relationship, dominance, power, looking down, looking down on him, and he weaker, shorter, looking up. Now, it's not to suggest that short people are weak. That's not at all, right? This is about the shot. Benjamin could be taller than this guy, but he's lower in the frame. In this shot, he gets upstairs, he slams the door. They could have put anything on this wall. There could have been a hat stand, a bookcase, a, a poster. Could have been anything. But they chose to put a target. We see it. No commentary in the movie. He doesn't look at it and say, I feel like that target. I feel like everyone's kind of, I feel like I'm being attacked. He doesn't have to say that. It's right there. The lines, 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 and a target. Okay, so I think you recognize the setup here. Let's go ahead and jump in and watch this scene. I just want to pause and just note the camera hasn't moved here. It's a very static shot. The opposite of static is dynamic. Okay, we're going to use those terms. It's a locked in shot. It's a locked down camera. How look how long it's been locked down. I'm putting it here by the door. Will you bring it in to me? I'd camera hasn't moved, has it? It's All just right. tilted up a little. Put it in Elaine's room where we So were. there's a lot of tension and this look how long the shot here is just empty. We hear the voices off screen, okay? This creates a lot of tension because it's like something has to happen, right? Camera moves back here, okay? And there's a reflection, really important. We talked about this. We see her reflection several times, lots of glass. The irony here, of course, is that Mrs. Robinson's reflection is in the portrait of Elaine. The mother is using the daughter to entice this young man. Okay, two, three, boom. Oh, God. Oh, let me out. Okay, we have a lot going on there, right? Let's watch, watch the rest of the scene. Don't be nervous. Get away from that door. I want to say something first. Jesus Christ. Benjamin, I want you to know that I'm available to you. And if you won't sleep with me this time... Oh, my Christ. If you... Okay, a lot going on there. Let's take a look at it. First, he turns. He turns three times in a row. Does he actually turn three times in a row? No. He turns once. But the feeling of what he discovers is so shocking. Instead of just doing like a double take, like you see something and then you go, what? But here it's like, whoa, whoa. Right? It's like a triple take. Let's take a look at it again. That's the triple turn. That is a jump cut because it's non-continuous. That's the first thing I want you to pay attention to. And what it means also is important. And what it means is he can't believe it. He can't believe it. It's just through the edit, we convey his utter shock and disbelief. Oh, God. Oh, let me out. Don't be... So we see her in an over the shoulder, an important term. We see her over his shoulder, important because it blocks her breasts. Get away from that. Now look here though, in the reverse, this over the shoulder, we see more of her here than we see of him there. This is a different over the shoulder. This shot size tells us what? What do we see of him? Just his little head popping up over here, which tells us what? He's trapped. 
She's got him where she wants him. The shot tells us that. We could have put the camera over there, over there. We could have done an overhead. We could have done a tilt up. Could have put the camera anywhere. We could have had the camera move. We could have zoomed in. We could have zoomed out. We could have done a wide shot. The director could do anything he or she wishes to do. In this case, Mike Nichols specifically chose to do an over the shoulder. Away from that door. I'm say something first. Jesus. Now we had another example there, and that was what we call a frame flash. Okay. We see her reflection, and then once she's trapped, we see single frame flashes of her nude body. Now you can look it up in the film. That's the time code for you. Christ. Benjamin, I want you to know that I'm available to you. And if you won't sleep with me this time, oh my Christ. if you won't. So great. Because he keeps reacting to the frame flashes. So what are the frame flashes? They're moments when he actually sees her. You can see how, how much information in that scene was conveyed through editing. An example of a subjective camera. I want you to make a distinction here between subjective camera and objective camera. An objective camera represents an objective observer, a disinterested, impartial observer, someone who sees things as equal and balanced, someone who doesn't take sides. Okay? So if you're standing on the corner and you see a car accident, you're an objective observer. You saw exactly what happened, like a camera, like a traffic camera might. But if, God forbid, you're in the car, you're no longer an objective observer. You're a subjective observer. That means you are physically, personally experiencing something. Same thing with a subjective camera. They show us the point of view of the character. And we intuitively know that we're seeing the character's point of view. And if you remember the scuba shots, the shots from inside the scuba outfit. Those were Benjamin's perspectives. And what happened to the sound, very interestingly? It went out. We couldn't hear anything anymore because once, he, I guess, he put that mask on or whatever, he couldn't hear them. And all we could hear was his breathing because that's all he can hear. And what is the effect of that? It draws us closer to him. We... We're more involved in the movie. We're more involved in the story. We know what he's going through. Great films do one important thing. They involve their audience emotionally. There's a reflection of Mrs. Robinson on the table. How is she introduced to us? Through a reflection. Reflection is glass. Reflection separates. You can still see through it, but it creates a separation. There's a lot of reflection in glass between Benjamin and Mrs. Robinson. There's another really great jump cut. It's when Benjamin is in Berkeley. Some context, remember, he's asking her to marry him. He thinks that she's the answer to all his problems. And he wants to marry her now. I just don't think it would work. Why wouldn't it? Benjamin, you're Okay, do you see what happened there? When we cut from the first shot to the second shot, how much time has passed? 60 minutes, 90 minutes? Okay, why is this important? Because the cut tells us something about his determination to marry her, his single-mindedness. He can stand outside of a classroom for 90 minutes, and for us, no time has gone by, and for him, 90 minutes later, for him, no time has passed. Why wouldn't it? Okay, you see how the cut tells us something about him. What does it tell us about him? That he's obsessed with her. And don't forget here, he's acting like what? Like a grown-up or like a baby or like a child? I want to marry you. I want to marry you now. He has no plan. He has no money. He has no job. He has no idea where they would live. He just want, he thinks that she's going to be the solution to his problems. We're looking at another example here. This is not editing. This is cinematography. Let's look at the scene. Here we go. Remember the scene? Stop believing me. I just don't believe you would do that. Try me. Let me try the corner. What's the matter? Three, put your hands up. 
Okay. Who's in focus here? She's in focus. Elaine. Elaine is in focus. She has no idea. And who's in the background? Mrs. Robinson. He looks up, so that cues Elaine to look behind her. So Elaine turns. How quickly did the sh focus shift from Elaine to Mrs. Robinson? Look again. So who's in focus here? Elaine. How quickly does the focus shift to Mrs. Robinson? Instantly. Why? Because Elaine sees her instantly. Boom. Very fast rack focus. She walks out of the shot. Elaine turns back. Elaine's not in focus. Let's let the shot play out. Elaine's not in focus. She comes slowly into focus. When is she in focus? When she finally realizes it. So what we have, what does the focus represent here? The focus is her thought. The focus is her realization. The focus is telling us that she's processing and the focus, could we have just instantly focused back to her quickly? Yes. The camera doesn't do that. Oh, shit. Right? She gets it. So what is happening here? This slow rack focus represents Elaine getting what happened between Ben and her mom. Here we are. Let's watch the scene. Look at the close-ups. Pay attention to what they mean. Notice how long this take is. A long take is a shot that doesn't cut right away. It goes long. Why are we in a close-up and why does it last so long? Long take, isn't it? We're just only on her the whole time. Why? Because she can only hear and see him. We're right there so we know that we're in her head, so to speak. Right? We're in her headspace, in her mind, and we're not cutting anything else yet because she can only see one thing. Do we see what she sees? Not yet. But we know that she's looking only at one person because to her, only one person matters. Still, what a long take, isn't it? Those are the tight expressionistic close-ups. Those close-ups of Elaine, her mom, her dad, and Carl all tell us information. First of all, it's important to realize she can't hear what they're saying. She's just not, doesn't matter what they're saying. We can't hear it because she can't hear it. That's subjective. Next, we're on a tight close-up of her. We stay on it for a long take because we're in her headspace. Then we see the dad, the mom, and Carl in really tight, ugly close-ups, shouting without words. That tells us that's how she sees them. She sees them as big and ugly and angry, and what they say doesn't matter. So what happens? Wow. It's fantastic, isn't it? So to recap, a motif is a, vi a recurring repeating visual or audio theme. Another example of a motif is Mrs. Robinson's clothing. Think of Mrs. Robinson as the beast in the jungle. A lot of the things that she wears all have leopard skin, tiger patterns. Why? 
her clothing, this re repetition of this theme, tells us something important. What does it tell us? That she's a predator. She's a predator. She's like a beast in the jungle. She's hunting her prey. She's manipulative. She's cunning. She's sexual. Music and sound plays a very, very important role. Do you notice how all the music is Simon and Garfunkel? And songs that are played are played again and again. The Sounds of Silence starts the film. Sounds of Silence ends the film. Steven Soderbergh, the director, made a point in his conversation with Mike Nichols in an interview. He said, no one had ever used music like this before, letting songs play for an extended period of time. The second song, April, She Will Stay, talks about April, May, June, July. It uses the calendar in the song to indicate time passing and that their relationship is continuing through the entire summer. Backlighting is when a, a character is lit from behind and that means they are in shadow or silhouetted. Can you remember where that happens? It happens here. It's filmed from down below. It's a tilt up because that's his perspective. He can't see them very clearly. He's at a disadvantage. He's loafing around in the pool. His dad's angry with him. Where's the sun? Right there. What do we call this? A lens flare. That's a no-no. Mike Nichols deliberately broke the rules here. This is what we would call an ugly shot. You can't see the characters' faces. Everything's all kind of bleachy and white. Lens flare used to be in Hollywood. You'd get fired for using lens flare. But Mike Nichols doesn't care. He's like deliberately doing this for a reason. It shows us Benjamin's perspective of them. Notice the moment where he has to interact with Mrs. Robinson. Say hi to Mrs. Robinson, he said, she said. Hello, Mrs. Robinson. Hello, Benjamin. Look at that shot, okay? The background is totally overexposed. She's in total shadow. It's a terrible shot, but it's a brilliant shot because it's terrible, right? That's how he sees her from way down there, and that's how he feels, okay? It's not a beautiful shot. We have backlighting characters with direct sunlight into the camera. Um, in that one scene, we also have lights out. We literally have complete black on the screen when the light goes out. Last one I want to show you is really important, and this is the telephoto zoom in compressed space. Okay. This is when you use a telephoto lens, a long lens, that looks like a telescope. It's an easy way to remember it. And on top of that, you zoom in all the way. Feels like he's running for a very, very, very long time. He keeps running, but he's not making any progress. Keeps running and running and running in the same shot. How is that possible? It's a telephoto zoom shot with compressed space. They put the camera very, very, very far away and then put a giant telescopic lens on it and zoomed in all the way, just as though they're looking at a star. And what that does is it focuses on a very, very small area of space and it, it makes it feel like it's much closer. It's that simple. So he feels much closer here than he actually is. He's really, really, really far away, which is why it looks like he keeps running. So thematically, the big question of the film is this shot here. And the question the really the film is asking, the whole point of the film, the, the big theme of the film is, okay, Benjamin, you rebelled against your parents. You slept with your dad's partner's wife. Uh, you dumped her for her daughter. And now you finally convinced her to marry you. Okay. Now what? Where are you going to go? What are you going to do? You're in the back of a bus, a public bus in Santa Barbara, without a cent in your pocket. Your car is broken down. You don't have a place to go. You don't have a job. You don't even know where this bus is going. And your bride is right next to you, having just married someone else, still in her wedding dress. Are they kissing? Are they joyous? Well, they're joyous for the first moment, but then they stop. They realize that there's no future for them as a couple. 
The end of the film tells us the meaning of the film. Remember that. And what this means is they don't know what the hell they're doing. Steven Soderbergh says, at this point in the film, we are both in the experience and outside of it, especially at the end of the movie where the looks on their faces make you rethink the whole movie. This is a very unsatisfying ending. It's not a Hollywood ending. Imagine how the film would have been different if he had just grabbed her and then the last shot of the film would have been them in a beautiful embrace, kissing. Yuck, the whole movie would have been ruined. You guys are gonna be living happily ever after, you two kids. It's not realistic. Let's take a look at some images real quick. The jungle background emphasizes Mrs. Robinson's predatory nature and role in the film. There's the jungle pattern. There's a jungle in the background. How many backyards have you seen that look like that? The awning has the stripes. Notice here the composition of the frame. Composition is important. He is literally framed by Mrs. Robinson. Trapped. That's a motif. We've talked about him being trapped. This shot tells us that she's got him where she wants him. Not to be vulgar about it, but right between her legs. Right? Right in the crook of her knee. It's a very visually powerful moment. How about a wide angle shot? This shot is wide because it makes him look the way he feels. Ridiculous. If we had a close up here, we wouldn't get a sense of how dumb he looks and how dumb he feels. But by opening this shot up, by getting the stove and the kitchen and the door and the fridge, we see him in context and we go, you look like an idiot. And he's thinking, I feel like an idiot. Ben is an object being pushed back into the water in this subjective POV shot. His dad is literally pushing him slash us into the water. His dad is pushing him down, suffocating him, controlling him. A shot that's similar to this. He comes back to find Elaine. Elaine? Hello, Benjamin. Now, that was all handheld, close up. The Where phone. Hello, get me the police, please. Where is Elaine? I'll be with you in a moment. Do you Still handheld. She's calling the cops. Good, we have a burglar here. Okay, we have a burglar. Just a second, I'll ask him, are you armed? Are you armed? What shot are we going to see right now? Boom. That's a perfect wide angle shot. Look how small he is in the frame. Right? She calls the police to report a burglar and the, the dispatcher asks, is he armed? So she says, I'll ask him, are you armed? And this is the shot that we get. Why? Because of course he's not armed. He's the farthest thing from armed. He's a silly, idiotic boy running around trying to find Elaine. So the wide angle shot gets a laugh here. It's a funny shot. It's a punchline, right? Patrol car in the vicinity of 1200 Glenview Road. Good, we have a burglar here. Just a second, I'll ask him, are you armed? No, I don't believe. Right? The shot gets the laugh because it answers the question. The shot tells us not only that he's not armed, but look at him. Look at how he looks and look at where he is. All right, guys. Thanks again for your patience. Now I want you to move on with the rest of the module. That's all, folks. Now move on to module two, readings. Have a great weekend, a great week. I'll see you guys next week in module three. Bye-bye.